Hello and welcome to Tag One Team Talks, the blog and podcast of Tag One Consulting. We're commemorating the 20th anniversary of Drupal with an interview series featuring community leaders talking about their Drupal experiences. I'm really excited to have Mike Anello, aka Ultimike, on the show today. Mike's the co-founder of Drupal Easy and the host of the very popular Drupal Easy podcast. I'll introduce Mike shortly. Uh, I'm Michael Myers, the managing director at Tag One. Tag One is the number two all-time contributor to Drupal. We build large-scale applications for global companies and order with Drupal, as well as many other technologies. We're also one of the official providers of Drupal 7 extended support and can help you run and build on your D7 site after it reaches end of life next year. If you want to learn more about either of these things, please reach out. So I want to introduce you to Michael Anello. Uh, as I said at the top of the show, many of you will know him as the co-founder of Drupal Easy and the host of the Drupal Easy podcast. Uh, Michael's been involved in the Drupal community uh, for a very long time now. Uh, for over 14 years, Drupal Easy has uh, provided Drupal training and consulting. Uh, you guys offer some really amazing classes and opportunities. I saw that 12-week Drupal career online training intensive, which was pretty wild. Uh, and then some courses that I was really interested in using some shorter topic specific stuff like composer basics for Drupal developers and, you know, learning how to do local development with DDEV, which are two things that I need to do, you know, and, and be much better at. So um, in addition, you know, uh, Mike's also a very well-known contributor uh, who's done a diverse array of things uh, he helps guide the community, which is really interesting, and I want to come back to and talk about this more later. Uh, he helps manage the Drupal Association's community cultivation grants. He's the chair of the conflict resolution team and a member of the community health team. Uh, he's made many code contributions, including being a Drupal core subsystem maintainer for the migrate module. Uh, he's contributed to many in, uh, core and contrib projects um, and has also contributed to documentation. And I love how documentation is literally the second thing listed on everybody's profile. <laughs> I don't know if that's a subtle hint that, that we need more document, uh, doc contributors like Mike, but, um, and of course, he's also involved in a lot of conferences and events. He's been a local meetup organizer, uh, a Drupal ambassador, welcoming new people to the community at large conferences like DrupalCon. And he's a very frequent speaker at these events. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for all your contributions to the community, and, and thank you so much for, for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. When you spread all that stuff out over 14 years, it's not very much, though. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's like less than one thing a year. So, I mean. <laughs> Except you're doing like them all in parallel and for many, many years. Um, <laughs> but... To, to set the stage, you know, before we jump into, you know, the community uh, and, and your contributions to the community, um, I want to talk a little bit about your Drupal career. Um, you know, you've been a member of the community for uh, 16 years now. Sorry, Drupal Easy uh, was founded 14 years ago. You've been a member of the Drupal community for uh, around 16 years. Uh, I'm curious, how did you first discover Drupal? You know, I think my story... You know, for folks who have been in the community as long as I have, my story is very similar to others where I was building, you know, websites for clients and I was doing a lot of it just bespoke. And I find myself, you know, implementing a login system, implementing this feature, implementing that feature over and over and over again. And I, I you know, I realized, oh, there's got to be a better way. And so I started looking into open source and I, you know, I played with like Joomla and Clone and one called OS Commerce and one called Zoops with an X. And I just kind of started playing with content management systems um, to figure out if there was something there and something I enjoyed. And really when I, when I stumbled upon Drupal and I discovered that you could add modules without having to like patch core, which was you know, my experience with a lot of these, these other CMSs, I said, okay, this is, this is put together very nicely. Um, and I, I just started moving my clients towards Drupal and, and learning more and more about it. And the more I learned about it, the more I liked. Um, this was back Drupal 4.6, 4.7 uh, days. Um, and really, you know, since that time, I, I haven't, you know, I, I've had plenty of work. 
like you know, like most Drupal developers, and I haven't really needed to go anywhere else. So, how did Drupal Easy uh, come about? You were doing this client work and consulting. What led to the creation of of Drupal Easy? It was actually Ryan Price and I, um, both from Central Florida, and uh, myself and Ryan and, and Andrew Riley um, started a meetup group, and there was a fourth person as well. I always forget his name because he was only around for like that first year or so. Um, but we started a meetup group in Central Florida and we would get together once a month and you know, none of us knew a whole lot, but each of us would present on the little that we did know just to start sharing knowledge and, and, and gain momentum. And um, at some point, Ryan and I just started talking about that we should team up on projects. And, and he had this name, he had the domain, uh, Drupal Easy. And we said, well, that's, that's a pretty good name. So let's, let's start there. And we started teaming up on projects together. And that's kind of how Drupal Easy got started. Um, as a local community organizer, is there something you wish that, you know, someone had told you early on or along the way that would have made your life easy, you know, and, and do you have any tips or tricks to other folks out there that are trying to, you know, galvanize their local community? Yeah, I think the one thing, well, I, I, I figured it out pretty early. I think we all did, but we were lucky because we all came in with about the same level of knowledge, which was not very much knowledge at all. Um, and I think that allowed us to kind of get past any imposter syndrome because we knew that there was nobody in the room who was looking at us like we were crazy. Like, what are they talking about? Because there was no one there who knew very much more than anybody else. So it was very welcoming. And I think that's a good lesson. Um, I think that still holds true a lot of times today in, in local meetup groups um, where just don't be afraid. If, if you have something to present, if you have something that you know, you know, ask to share it. Even if it's only five, 10 minutes worth, there's bound to be people in the room who don't know what you know. Um, and the more you can do that, the more you will start gaining confidence and the easier it will be for you to share information, the easier it will be for folks to look at you as if you, you know, have some level of expertise. Um, and really just, you know, that, that leads to more networking and more work. Seems to be a, a big theme. You know, folks have talked to Angie Byron, you know, all these amazing contributors that we know today all said, you know, I, I was in way over my head. I went to this event and I just said, yeah, I can help with that. Or, you know, they, they just started talking to people and, you know, it, it was what catapulted, you know, their, their knowledge, their career, their engagement in the community. Um, so I think that's really great advice. Um, and uh, I love that you, you are, are doing the local organizing. I can't believe it's something that we haven't yet uh, talked about in these 20 years because local camps to me are, you know, the foundation, the, the lifeblood of Drupal. And, and one of the things that I think has really made it what it is today. You know, there's a, a meetup uh, every week in many places around the world. Uh, there's this amazing local community. It's how knowledge and information spreads about Drupal. It's how people help each other and build these networks. Uh, so I think it's really awesome that you're doing it because it is not easy to, you know, find these, you know, contributors, these speakers, sustain the community. It, it takes a tremendous amount of effort, so. Yeah, I should definitely say, I don't do as much of that now as, I, as I've done in the past. I actually, I was one of the main organizers of Florida Drupal Camp for 13 years. And I decided after 13 years that, okay, that's, that's about enough. <laughs> so you know, we have some, some great folks that, are, that have taken the reins of Florida Drupal Camp. Um, you know, I think in any, any organization or any group, but you know, change of leadership is a sign of health. So yeah. um, I felt like after 13 years, you know, it's time for me to step aside and let someone else kind of get that, uh, you know, get that limelight and get that um, just experience of doing that stuff. And it, it just, it builds street cred and, you know, there, there's really no downside other than the, well, other than the hours you have to invest. <laughs> <laughs> I think transition is good for everybody's health, <laughs> the, the community and, and the organizers. Um, yeah. So do you remember your first contribution to the community? It, it needn't be code, um, but you know uh, what it was and, and how it went. 
I mean, technically, it, it, I, I think it would have to be the, um, you know, the events that I spoke at early on and organizing that first Florida Drupal camp. I don't know if I had made any code contributions at that point when, when we organized the first uh, Florida Drupal camp. Um, I do remember I actually uh, created a, um, my first code contribution was a module. It was called something like Dino Searcho or something like that. And it, it basically, oh, I, I believe, and I have to go back and look, but I believe it a lot, it was kind of like a, a, a search box that allowed you to search for organic groups on the site, but using Ajax. So you could start typing the name of the group and then the background, it would go search and, and, and you know, populate a little list for you. I think that was my very first code contribution. That's awesome. Uh, and I love the name. <laughs> I know Sergio. Hey, yeah. <laughs> um, you, you've made a lot of contributions. Uh, is there something that you're most proud of or that sticks out in your mind as, you know, a, a really amazing experience? Um, you know, I'm probably most proud of like being on the community working group and the conflict resolution team because it's, it's really freaking hard work. It's really, you know, challenging. It uses a completely different part of my brain and it, you know, constantly challenges me. You know, I've learned, uh, and I've been on the team for five years, maybe now. Um, I've learned more about patience in the last five years uh, than, than in all my other years put together. <laughs> So I, I'm pretty proud of that. I'm, I'm also really proud of, you know, I keep coming back to this, but the Florida Drupal community. Um, I, you know, I know I'm biased when I say this, but I really think our event um, is one of the, you know, the, the best Drupal camps out there. I, I think we really focus on not just the content, but also people coming and smiling, right? And having a good time and interacting with another and, and, and having a positive experience not just from the technical side, but from the networking side and just having like, you know, a good, a, a good time so that they want to return. So I'm, I'm pretty proud of the focus we've had on that uh, in, in Florida. Makes all the difference. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, that's the biggest part of going to conferences and events for me is, is meeting the people in the community. So I love that your camp is putting a big focus on that. Um, I want to keep going with what you were talking about with the DA and then we'll go back to the code stuff. Um, this is another thing that we haven't talked about yet in the, uh, you know, 20 year series. You know, you do all this work for the Drupal Association and the community with these working groups. Um, can you just, you know, what are the cultivation grants? You know, what is the conflict resolution team? You know, what is the community health team? You know, why do we need things and, you know, I know they're important, but can you tell the community why these are so important? Sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll try and be short <laughs> with each of these, although I could go on, but I'll try not to. So the Community Cultivation Grants Program is currently on hiatus right now, mainly because of COVID. Um, without having in-person Drupal cons, there's a lot less income to the Drupal Association, and that's how this program got funded, was money from the Drupal Association. But the idea behind it was to provide grant money to emerging local communities. Um, so, it, well, it, and it actually didn't even have to be a local community. It was some project that was going to cultivate the community. So, you know, the, the classic example of this was some first time camp organizers need 500 bucks to reserve a venue so they can have their first event. So that would be something where they could apply for the grant and if accepted, we would, we would give them that money and that would kind of help kickstart, you know, their event. Um, and I think, you know, I, I don't even know how many years that's been going on. It's probably been at least 10 years. Um, and, and we funded, you know, all kinds of projects all over the world. So that, that was very gratifying. And it was kind of, you know, it was one of the better, you know, volunteer gigs I've ever had because it's, it, the job is to give out money. So, you know, it's not a bad thing. It's a good place um, to be. And it's amazing what, what they do with these grants. It really, yeah. um, it's pretty wild. It's very cool. Um, the, so the conflict resolution team, community health team. So these are both part of the Drupal community working group. So for a long time, up until a couple of years ago, the community working group was basically just the conflict resolution team. They were one and the same. 
And the, so the conflict resolution team um, basically has the, the job of, you know, fostering community health. So, uh, you know, it's upholding the, the code of conduct. So if someone is, is misbehaving or um, using you know, inappropriate language in an issue queue, um, then sometimes it's up to us to step in and say, hey, you got to stop doing that. Um, and when we talk to the person, we explain why it's not appropriate. And hopefully, you know, the lesson is learned and we all go about our business. Unfortunately, we're, you know, because we have the authority, um, sometimes we have to, you know, ban people from, from Drupal.org or Slack for a period of time. And that tends to be the stuff that we're more well known for than our successes. Um, most of what we do is successes where we, we basically, we, we mitigate conflict or we, we, we talk to people and say, here's this person's perspective, here's that person's perspective, let's try and find some, some place in the middle. We don't have to be best friends, but we do have to be respectful. And um, so there's just a lot of, of mediation involved with that. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, we decided that the community working group wanted to do more proactive health measures because um, we were mainly, we only had time to do the reactive stuff where someone would file an issue with us and say, hey, this person's being a jerk, you need to talk to them. And so we'd have to, we'd always be reacting. And we felt there was an opportunity to, to do some proactive things, some trainings or um, something like our nudge program that, that is on, on drupal.org. Um, so we actually um, started growing the team and we put together like this other subgroup called the uh, community health team. And so those folks are, are focused more on the proactive side of things where the uh, conflict resolution team is still focused more on the reactive side of things. Um, and, you know, we're, we're starting to, to have some successes on the proactive side of things. We have, a, you know, kind of an ongoing series of workshops that, that we're always offering. One that most people know about is the, um, the code of conduct contact training. So this is for folks who are code of conduct contacts for their local events. Um, and we kind of train them on, well, what happens if you have an incident at your, at your event? How do you actually process that? How do you actually, you know, you know what, what are the best practices if someone at your event is, is not behaving the way they should be? Um, yeah, so maybe I'll stop there. Otherwise, I'll keep talking. <laughs> well, there's there's too much to cover. We should do a follow up episode on on the community working group because it's it's really important. Um, it to me stands out as something you know a maturation point in the community. You know, this is a 20 years of Drupal podcast. You know, if if you think of you know most open source projects don't have or need you know such a community working group, um, and even if they did, they they couldn't put it in place. You know, so this right. is I think a really important mark of maturity for Drupal that we have all of these community cultivation grants that we you know, give local communities a chance, that we fund people to go to DrupalCon, that we you know, care about the, the health and the well-being in the community and have the resources to put these things in place and address them. And- yeah, um, absolutely. And you know, we are definitely a leader in this area among open source communities. Um, you know, this whole uh, community working group team came out of the fact that code of conflict issues, you know, before us, basically, Dries had to, you know, get involved in each of them. Um, so he basically chartered us and empowered us to, to do this for him. Um, and then a few years ago, actually, uh, we decided, and our escalation point at that point was always Dries. If someone didn't like what we were doing, they would escalate to Dries. And um, we actually changed that a, a few years ago where we are actually, our, our review panel, our escalation point is actually the two community elected DA board members, as well as a third person who, uh, right now it's John O'Bacon. So it's not someone who's, who's typically in the Drupal community. Um, so we felt it was very important for our review panel to be at least the majority of them to be decided and picked by the community, um, which is the case right now. So Dries is actually out of it at this point. He's not part of that, that chain of command. Um, and we routinely have um, queries from other open source communities asking us about our processes and asking for, for help on their end. So much so that we have put together and we haven't promoted it too much yet. Um, we're still kind of getting our, our feet wet with it, but we've started um, a monthly Zoom call 
with um, other open source communities and, and, and their version of the community working group folks, people in other open source communities who deal with conflict resolution. Um, so we can start talking about best practices and what we can learn from one another and just kind of almost like a support group for, for, for this, kind of, uh, this kind of role. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that these, you know, I'd love to have you back to talk more about these uh, community working groups. Uh, we did an open source leaders series, uh, you know, talking to people behind, you know, big open source projects, you know, from Drupal to Prosmere to get different perspectives. And I think one of the amazing things that, that Dries has done, one of the things I, I admire about him um, is his ability to let go and to empower people and I think it's a, an area that the community has done well in pushing him to do that and taking over that responsibility and scaling us as a community. I think that's been core to our success, um, you know, and, and, and then putting these, you know, programs in place. Um, so switching back to the, the code side of things for a minute, um, you are a Drupal core maintainer or, or were for the migrate subsystem uh, there are very few core maintainers in this world. And so I'm really curious as to how one becomes uh, a, a core maintainer. Uh, I was bullied into it. <laughs> so in the run up to Drupal 8, um, I knew that I wanted to be involved in the, in the migrate uh, subsystem. Um, I did a lot of migrations, a lot of stuff with the migrate module for Drupal 7. Um, and I, and I wanted to really learn it for Drupal 8. So I started getting involved in that issue queue, working with great people uh, like Benji and, and CHX and, um, oh my gosh, oh, Quiet One is uh, from, uh, uh, there's a bunch of other people who, in there whose names I can't remember right now. And I apologize for that. But um, I was, I was a pretty regular contributor. I was learning a lot at the time. I mean, I was by no means was I, you know, I was, I was probably the weakest link, um, but I was willing to put time in and learn. And I did, I learned a bunch and I, and I, I you know, I had a bunch of commits and I think because I was so consistent over, you know, maybe a year, uh, 18 months time frame, um, they asked me to uh, come on as one of the subsystem maintainers. Which you know, a huge honor. Um, a little bit intimidating, a, a bit of imposter syndrome on my part for sure. Um, but I was in that role for I don't even know how many, I, maybe a year, maybe a little bit less than a year. Um, and then honestly, you know, I, I started getting involved in in you know the, the training side of our business was picking up, and I just didn't have the time to, to, to well, pun intended, I guess, to commit to it anymore. And I, I stepped down from that role. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I learned I mean, a lot, you know, and, you know, it's, it's weird because I, I try and balance my contributions. I try to balance coding contributions, like kind of left brain, right brain contributions. Um, and right now I feel like I'm, I have too much on the right brain side. Like I'm kind of itching to get back to the code contribution side of things, which I haven't had a whole lot of bandwidth to do lately. That's awesome to, to switch between the two. I never really uh, thought about that. And I was looking at, you know, your, your litany of things that you've done. And, and, and when you said that, I was like, oh my gosh, that makes, that makes total sense as to how you're involved in all these different things. Um, yeah, I get know, bored the, easily. So, I mean, you know, I, 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 I enjoy the event organization or I, I should say I enjoyed it. I guess I'd still enjoy it. Um, but there's some times where I just, you know, I, I want to be doing code as well. So I flip flop back and forth. I'm, I'm constantly in search of that balance, you know, then throw in like, you know, you know, paid work and then throw in family and stuff. And just finding that balance is, you know, as everybody knows, is just so tricky. Definitely. Um, the other migrate maintainers over the years, Mo Schweitzman, Mike Ryan, Lucas Hedding. I mean, these are some of oh, the most Mike, yeah, yeah, Mike was huge to help me. Yeah, <laughs> I can't believe yeah. I forgot his name. I, I would have some serious imposter syndrome, you know, going up against those guys and being part of that group. Um, that, I learned know. so much. I mean, you know, I, I learned I learned so much from, from from those folks. What is something that you learned as a core committer that you didn't, you know, that in your Drupal contributions to code previously? you hadn't been aware of because it's a very different perspective. Sure. 
just how much every single line of code matters, right? Just how, I mean, it, it, it gives me so much confidence in Drupal core, knowing the hurdles and all the discussions we had over every single patch that went into core. Um, it gives me a great, you know, a great deal of, uh, it helps me sleep at night knowing that uh, you know, I, I kind of saw how the sausage was made in one little, little sliver of Drupal, and I know that you know core committers are are sweating the details on all of these commits, and it makes Drupal it makes the code you know all the better, and um, it, it's really it's really interesting to see and to learn. They do really review every line of code. You know, it's great that you point that out because I don't think people yeah. you know. There's a lot of obfuscation, not purposely, but you know, because Drupal is such a big community and there are so many layers to what we do, I'm not sure that everybody is aware of how much effort and energy goes into you know, reviewing and, and managing code. Yeah, and, and, and not even that, but just looking at it, not only from like a micro level, like you know, not even just looking at the trees line by line, but being able to step back and look at like the bigger picture, how does this, fit in with everything else, you know, could this potentially be duplicated, you know, with this thing over there and just having that big picture, you know, some folks have that. And I mean, it's, it's amazing. It really is, uh, you know, so much credit to the folks who have, have that skill. It's a, it's a whole other gear. Totally. And, and, you know, going back to jumping in and, and career and, and professional experience, you know, this is what sets these people apart and they make insane money because they're insanely good at what they do. And so it's, you know, it's a huge career development opportunity for people to get more engaged in core and, and the whole core development process because it really is another level. I think one thing, that, uh, one thing we probably should absolutely mention that all of these folks have in common is they're also really good communicators. Right, so I mean, you could have folks, and we probably both know people who are really, really good coders, but not so good communicators. Um, I, you know, I can't really think of anyone that I interacted with at the core level from either code review or other uh, maintainers who didn't excel in both, who didn't excel in coding and excel in being able to communicate communicate clearly and succinctly and you know whether it's you know whether it's over a, a zoom call or in an issue queue or on skype well, skype slack <laughs> um or irc i guess i should have said um yeah being able to communicate is i think the older i get the more i value that you know people can communicate well it's it's critical people who don't have that skill and, and that's you know most of us um, you know, again, another reason to get engaged and learn from these people and, and develop that skill, because you're right, it's, it's so rare, you know, I meet amazing developers that blow me away and I meet amazing developers that are great communicators and, and they're a world apart. Um, it's a, it's a really rare beast to have both those skills and it makes a huge difference. Um, so you've been to so many conferences and events around the world. Um, is there a particular experience or memory that stands out for you? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's anything in particular. Um, I, I, it's more general for me. I like, I'm more of a morning person than a, than a nighttime person. So I've had some really interesting conversations over breakfast with people at Drupal events, um, either right, you know where I just run into someone, or you know it's kind of a planned thing. Um, but I kind of feel, you know, I know everyone gives us answer, but you know, Drupal events for me is is more about just the networking and and talking to people and having those, you know, hopefully quiet conversations as opposed to sitting in a hall with three hundred people watching, you know, someone give a presentation. Um, I can't think of anything specific. You know, I, I have really great memories of the first European DrupalCon I went to, which I believe was Paris. Um, you know, I was there with a, with a bunch of friends, you know, a bunch of folks from Florida. We all kind of traveled there together. So that was, that was a really nice one. Um, you know, I also have really 
interesting memories and maybe it's a regret. I actually went to uh, one of the first Drupal cons. It was part of, I think it was OS con and uh, it was actually on campus at Yahoo. Um, and I don't even know what, I, I, I almost don't want to look at how many years ago that was. Um, but I remember, I can look back at that and I remember everybody I talked to, um, like I still recognize their names in the Drupal community. That was really an event where some of the, 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 the longest time contributors in Drupal were at that event. And I feel like, you know, I should have been able to, to, to do more there. Um, I don't know, it's, it's kind of a weird regret because I, I don't like having regrets. And, you know, I was there for a reason and I got out of it what I got out of it. And I have no qualms about where I am today. Um, but I just looked back at that and said, yeah, you know, maybe if I had, it, it, it might be one of those things where um, I was thinking more about, I wanted to learn a little bit about everything rather than a lot about one thing and go deep. Um, but, you know, I think that might be, if I, if someone was yeah. new in the community, I might say, get a good foundation, don't go crazy, but then find something you love and you're passionate about and go deep in that and go deep early, right? If you love front-end development, then, you know, learn how to become the best freaking Drupal front-end developer you can. And don't worry about learning every single contrib module out there. It's, um, it's not that you can't meet these people today, but I feel like we have an unfair advantage because, you know, looking back at that OS CMS summit in Sunnyvale, it was a pretty small crowd and it was insanely concentrated with top Drupal contributors. I mean, if you said hello to someone, it would be, you know, Dries, it would be Mo Schweitzman, it, you know, you know, it was, it was an amazing crowd and, and a lot of amazing things happened there. That was where yeah. Jay Batson met Dries and the inklings of Acquia were formed. Um, That's, I know. actually had dinner. I said, there, there are a few of us at dinner one night and I sat next to him and I talked for most of the night and I can't, it, it kills me, I can't think of his name, but he's one of the guys who started PHP. Um, Rasmus Leardoff. Was yes, there. Rasmus. Yeah. Yep. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no, like, it was oh. insane. Yeah. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. You you invented PHP. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to eat that? Can I, can, <laughs> can I have some of your fries, please? <laughs> Rasmus has been surprisingly involved in the in the Drupal community. He was at the the second ever DrupalCon, I think, in the first one in Amsterdam. He was at yeah. the OS CMS Summit. He was the speaker in Copenhagen. He was one of the keynotes. Um, so yeah, he's been surprisingly in, involved yeah. in, in Drupal over the years. And, you know, it's probably one of the reasons that we had that Sunnyvale Summit. You know, Yahoo was using Drupal for a while and um, really awesome story for the folks who didn't check out that episode with Robert Douglas. Uh, he tells about how they didn't secure their first Drupal site and he, I can't get a hold. He's like calling Sunnyvale police. Like there's a break in at Yahoo <laughs> trying to get them to like address this problem. It's- uh, well, I have it's actually a really interesting tidbit about the, what is now considered the first DrupalCon that took place in Antwerp, Belgium. Um, I am literally sitting two blocks from that location right now. I walk by it almost every day. That, that little hotel where the very first DrupalCon was. And it kills me because um, I've been coming to Belgium for uh, since before I was married, so over 20 years, um, which means that I, you know, at some point there was a DrupalCon going on there with what, you know, 15 people um, during the time when I regularly visit the city. So I feel like if, if, I was, if I was tuned into the community a little bit more, whatever community it was at that time, um, I, I potentially could have been at that first one. It's it's mind blowing. There are local meetups that are way bigger than the first few Drupal cons. Yeah. <laughs> We've yeah. come such a long way, um, but I do miss that. Yep. yep, I miss that intimacy. You know, I, I miss the you know. There's now like Dev Days where you know it used to be a Drupal con. We would make major decisions about the future of Drupal. Like, you know, there has to be a testing harness and every, you know, core commit needs to have a test. Like these things came out of, you know, hacking at DrupalCon and talking to each other at DrupalCon and, you know, DrupalCons have become really big events. 
you know, so things have split off and it's, these are all signs of a healthy, growing, maturing community. Um, but, you know, there are some downsides or side effects to that. And, and one of them is, you know, sort of the fracturing of these different groups and, you know, the, the, the lack of concentration. Um, but if you're willing to jump in, you know, you can definitely meet all these people and have the same experiences that, that we had today. Um, so going back to uh, the, the platform or, or the community, uh, what is your favorite and least favorite aspect of Drupal, the platform or the community? You know, what's something we do great and what's something we need to improve? Um, you know, I think our code is amazing. You know, I, I think what's great about Drupal is the fact that as a community, we refuse to let it get stale. Right, as much pain as there was going from Drupal seven to eight and adopting Composer and you know and, and adopting all these Symfony components, ultimately it was you know to the great benefit of the code base. And so that kind of relentless pursuit of of staying modern, staying up to date is, I mean, it's extremely difficult. Um, but we're we're now seeing the rewards of that. Right, you're going from eight to nine. Um, you know, I updated DrupalEasy.com. Um, I, I actually could have done it months ago. I was waiting for one module um, to, 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 to uh, get up to Drupal 9 uh, readiness, um, but it took me a couple hours to, to go from eight to nine. And so we're starting to reap those, those, uh, those rewards. Um, on the other side of the coin, the one thing that worries me, I think it worries a lot of people. And if, if we could crack this as a community, I think it would be amazing is because we've radically changed the code base and we've admittedly made it more difficult to get started with Drupal, we don't have that those huge feeder bands of people who can discover Drupal as a hobbyist, as a side project anymore. There's some folks who, who still discover it that way, but um, you need a certain level of, of technical knowledge to even get started with Drupal at this point, that, that initial hurdle. And that, I think that's really, I don't, you know, I, I hate to use the word hurting, so I'll use the word changing. It, it's really changing the, the, the dynamics of the community because we do not have these huge influxes of potential new contributors coming in. We do have new contributors coming in. They're coming in, you know, some of them are coming as, as hobbyists. Some of them are coming in from other open source um, PHP projects um, who, who already know Composer, who are you know, maybe Symphony developers and stuff like that. But um, where it used to be a fire hose of people, it's not so much a fire hose anymore. Um, and so that kind of worries me because um, I, I don't think there's as many people who are, who are as active as there have been in the past. Um, there used to be a pyramid with a really, really wide base. Uh, that base is considerably more narrow now, I think. Um, I know that there's definitely, you know, some of the initiatives that Dries talked about recently are definitely, you know, aiming at trying to get that base to be bigger and to get more beginners and more hobbyists involved in Drupal. Um, it's not going to be easy, um, but I think if we can, if we can figure that out, um, it's going to be fantastic. And it's, I, you know, I don't know if any other open source project has, has had this exact issue and, and been able to solve it. Um, so I think it's, that's a big challenge. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really good point. Um, you know, there's a, every open source project, there's a really small number of contributors that make the majority of contributions, but the health of the project in the community is that broad base. And, you know, it's like, your, you know, your sales funnel, it, you know, and, and that might not be the best way to look at it, but you also, you know, to get those top contributors, you need a steady stream of people. And when I think about like what makes the Drupal community so special and you know, all these amazing people who care, you know, that are really good people, you know, I, I think a lot of that has to do with our broad contributor base historically and the kinds of people that it attracted. And, you know, Drupal, I don't know that it was ever easy, you know, which is why we need Drupal easy. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, there, there's always a big barrier to entry and learning curve to Drupal, but it's an order of magnitude more challenging now, you know, uh, since the transition from seven. And, you know, the makeup of the contributors, the makeup of the users, 
you know, you know, aspects like site building have never been more, which makes it, you know, has, you know, Drupal secret sauce in, in you know, empowering end users. Um, but at the same time, you know, there, you know, while there can be a bigger site builder community, the actual developer community is, um, you know, the makeup is changing. You know, you're seeing more enterprise users, you know, more enterprise contributors. And so sort of like the tenor uh, and the makeup of the community is shift, not just the numbers. And I, I worry about that, you know, uh, not to like the point of, oh my God, but, you know, it's definitely something that's in the back of my mind as to the health and the well-being of the community, but also one of the things that I love the most about it, you know, is the people and what sets it, you know, apart from all the other communities that I participate in is the people. And it's why I've stayed with Drupal so long um, is the people. And so, so I hope that, uh, uh, you know, amongst everything that we can continue to honor the roots, you know, and, and sort of the, the you know, the, the feeling, the being that is the Drupal community. So uh, I want to do our lightning round real quick because we only have a, a few minutes. Uh, so first things that pop into your mind, I'm going to run a few questions at you. Uh, who are your Drupal mentors? Yeah, I mean, it's that's such a difficult question because it's changed over, you know, over the years. Um, I'll start with, you know, I do a lot of work with um, uh, a guy named Andy Giles, who's a, just a really freaking good module developer. Um, I'm constantly learning stuff from him. Um, I've been friends with Ted Bowman for a while, who's a you know a chronic core contributor, really smart guy. Um, so those are probably two people that I go to for the coding side. Um, you know, on kind of the other side of things, and this is kind of a funny answer because I have a feeling she might feel the same way about me as I. You know, I, I'm really good friends with Amy June. Um, and I've actually, she's been through my class and, um, but she is constantly, um, uh, uh, I don't even know what the right word is, but she's on me to make sure that I am as inclusive as possible with everything I say, which is not a bad thing. I mean, the role that I'm in on the community working group and I interact with a lot of new folks, um, and it's really, it's kind of nice, you know, she's like a little, and I hope she doesn't listen to this because, you know, she'll make fun of me. But sometimes she's like a little like guardian angel. Like I know that if I say something stupid, she will be there to kind of nudge me and allow me to gracefully uh, apologize. And not that I'm saying a whole lot of stupid things, but it's just like little things. And I'll give you a great example. Um, I, you know, growing up, if I thought something like wasn't, if I didn't like something, I would call it lame. And, you know, if I say something like that now, she will always like DM me and say, I shouldn't say lame anymore, you know? And just like little things like that. And it's, it, it's good reminders and it's good to, to just make sure our language is as inclusive as possible. Um, and then the, the, I, maybe one other person would be, uh, you know, George Demet, who was the, uh, the previous chair of the community working group uh, before, I, before he stepped down and I stepped into that role. Um, and I've learned a you know, tremendous amount from him um, over the years as well. So, yeah, I, I could probably name a bunch of other people, but those are the four that, that pop in my head. It, there are so many amazing people to mention yeah. and, and so many people list you as a mentor. And, and in fact, I was looking at your Drupal.org page the other day, preparing for this interview. Uh, you are amongst the, the, you know, the people that have, that have the largest number of people claiming you as a mentor that I've seen in a long time. So I'm lucky enough where I teach a lot of people um, and I talk about mentors and I, you know, you know, part of one of the things in our class is we um, introduce every single one of our students to a, a, a community mentor. Um, so I think in my role is that I actually become, you know, I kind of fill that role as well. That's amazing. I love that idea. Uh, community mentor. That's really great. Um, favorite Drupal module? Uh, I'm going to say Path Auto and Why Isn't It in Core? And I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, Path Auto is a, a really great one. Uh, how is that not in Core? That's, yeah. Is that really not in Core? It's not in Core. I don't understand why it's not in Core. Wow. There's, there's like a short list of modules that everybody installs on every yeah. Drupal website. And, yeah. and that's certainly Admin one toolbar, of them. Toolbar, Redirect, Path Auto. Um, those are the three main ones. 
I can't live without my admin toolbar and just typing yeah. in what I'm looking for. Exactly. How is that not in core? I don't Amazing. Know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. So favorite Drupal easy podcast episode or, you know, the, the one that <sighs> I, you've, you've done so many podcasts it's yeah, crazy, I know. Uh, and it's hard to pick a favorite, but what's one that jumps to mind? I mean, the easy answers are that we've had Dries on once or twice. We've had Angie on a few times. Um, you know, one that always jumps to mind, and it's, it's, it's kind of a silly one. Um, and I had very little to do with it, which I, is why I think I probably like it, is um, we did like an April Fool's episode a few years ago that Ryan Price put together all of this ridiculous stuff. And, it, you know, in the nerdiest way, it was like super funny. And I always think about that. Like he's, he's such a creative, a creative person that he really just kind of, you know, he just went with it and it was great. Good humor in the community. I love it. Um, yeah. So as the, uh, you know, the creator of Drupal Easy's podcast, I'm curious what your favorite non Drupal Easy podcast is. So Drupal related or not Drupal related? Uh, either. Uh, the Daily, the New York Times mm -hmm. every morning they have, it's like 25 minutes. It's one story. I listen to it most mornings, I, you know, when I'm, when I'm home in Florida, you know, I literally, I get out of bed, I put the leash on my dog, I pop in my AirPods and I take my dog for a long walk and I listen to the daily. Um, it's just really well done. Um, it's, it's, I find it very difficult to get, you know, uh, news that doesn't make me mental these days. Um, I think it does, you know, I know a lot of people will say it's, it's as slanted as anyone else, but I think it, I think it does a pretty good job. It's, uh, it, it's a great, a great podcast. Uh, last question, mm -hmm. uh, who would you pass the torch to? Uh, who should I interview next uh, in the Drupal community? Yeah, I don't know if I have a name for you, but I like to hear from um, folks who, who, who don't have a whole lot of exposure yet. Like look at you know, the top 50 contributor modules and find a name of, in that list of committers um, or maintainers who you've never heard of and you know, get them some exposure. I think we as a community need to be doing everything we can to, um, to, to seek out like the next generation of leaders in our community. Um, you know, I, I've been a big proponent of a long time of, you know, I'm a baseball fan. So I like to see new speakers at Drupal cons. Um, but I'm also a big believer that you shouldn't speak at a Drupal con if you haven't spoken somewhere else first, because people pay a lot of money to go to Drupal con. So, you know, that's what, you know, meetups and, and camps are for, you know, if you yeah, know no, someone who, um, who, who knows something who's never presented before, you know, get them on a podcast or get them to present to a meetup group, a virtual thing or, or an in-person thing and kind of get them on the path to uh, leadership in our community. Yeah, it's a great idea. Podcasts are a great place to start because you can kind of speak extemporaneously. It's a, a bit lower pressure. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I, I agree, you know, uh, DrupalCon is, is a special event. The people, the number of people that attend your talks is, is substantial. You know, you need, you know, being a good presenter and putting together a good presentation takes a tremendous amount of effort, you know, and experience and, and people should get that. Um, and we do need more voices. Uh, I love your idea. I'm going to do exactly that. We're going to look through the top 50 and I'm sure there are many people in there that I don't know. And I think it would be really great to get a more diverse array of opinions, um, you know, in this 20 year series, not just the folks you know, like yourself and myself that have been here for a really long time. Yeah, no one wants to hear from us anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's time for us to be put out to pasture. <laughs> for everybody's health. Yeah. yeah. Ours and theirs. All right, Michael, thank you so much for, for joining me today uh, and to all of our viewers for listening and watching. We really appreciate you joining us as well. Uh, if you like this talk, please remember to upvote, subscribe and share it out. You can check out all of our interviews in this series at um, slash two zero uh, uh, tag talks and the latest technology topics at tag one.com slash talks. As always, we'd love your feedback on any uh, topic suggestions.
questions, you know, other folks that we should interview for this series, you can write to us at talkstag1.com. That's tag number. Uh, thanks again for tuning in. Take care.